The Renaissance was the period of the great flowering of literature, philosophy, art and science in Europe in the 15th and 16th centuries. For mathematicians, it's especially associated with the rediscovery of Greek learning, following the translation of Euclid and other Greek mathematical works into Latin, both from the Greek and from Arabic translations. But all this has tended to overshadow another and parallel tradition of vernacular works, that is, works written in the languages of the people, concerned not with scholastic learning, but with the practical problems of commerce and everyday life. These works were also responsible for the popularizing of the Hindu-Arabic numerals in Europe and for the demise of the counting board and the cumbersome Roman numerals. It's this tradition that we're now going to look at, examining some of the calculation methods used and tracing the numerals back via the Arabs to India. Towards the close of the 15th century, two remarkable vernacular works appeared. One, published in Venice, had considerable influence. The other, written in Lyon, remained virtually unknown for almost 400 years. The author of the Italian work was a friar, Luca Pacioli. Born about 1445, he was a private tutor in Venice, where he also joined the Franciscan order, later moving from city to city as a public teacher of mathematics. Here in Cambridge University Library, we have his most influential work, the Summa de Arithmetica Geometria Proportioni et Proportionalita. It's a summary of the basic mathematical knowledge of the time, printed in 1494, just 16 years after the first printed arithmetic published in Treviso, near Venice. To our modern eyes, it's a difficult book, with its 600 pages of close print and its unfamiliar abbreviations. The geometrical section is just elementary geometry with practical applications. But the section on commercial arithmetic is famous for the first published account of double-entry bookkeeping. But here we're concerned with arithmetic and algebra. So let's look at where Pacioni is discussing problem solving using algebraic methods. In solving a commercial problem, Pacioli arrives at this expression. Let's interpret it. First, co is short for cosa, literally thing, the unknown quantity, rx. So here he has a half x. Che is short for censo, a square, that is, the square of the unknown. P is short for pu, plus. There's no symbol for equals, here it's written in words. In solving this equation, he gets this. Here, capital R means radice, the root of whatever immediately follows. The men is meno, minus, often written just as the letter M. So this means root 625 minus 1, which is just 24. In another problem, when he wants to express the square root of a series of terms, he uses this symbol. He calls it the radice universale. It just means this. But now, let's look at this. Here, he's using a small letter r to mean the square root of the number immediately following. But what we can't tell, except from the context, is where the end of the first universal root is. In fact, the expression means this but it could just as well have been this. He also uses r to denote powers, but his first power means rx to the power of naught, his second power rx, and so on. We have to take great care reading Pacioli's text. The other important vernacular work was written by a Frenchman, Nicolas Chouquet. We learn from his manuscript that he was a Parisian, a bachelor in medicine, and that he lived in Lyon. 
We also know that he was a professional letter writer and an algorist, a teacher of calculation. Chouquet's manuscript consists of a three-part work on arithmetic and algebra called the Tripati, plus an appendix of problems, a geometry, and a commercial arithmetic. It's remarkable for its innovations, especially in notation and in the algebraic methods used. Here, for instance, Chouquet is simplifying an algebraic equation. First, this means square root, and it's easily extended to the cube and other roots just by changing the numeral. Also, he uses underlining to show precisely what a root acts on. Here's P for plus again, but don't be misled by these indices. They don't refer to the numbers. They mean powers of the unknown. So this is actually R 4x squared, and this is 4x, and this 2x. But now look at this page of the manuscript. This is quite new. The index naught is used with the number 72. It's as if we wrote 72x to the power of naught. It's divided by 8, 3, r, 8x cubed. Schuke's result is 9, 3m, that is, r 9x to the power of minus 3. And it's clear that he understood a negative index as a reciprocal. This is quite remarkable for his day. Schuke's symbolism was way ahead of its time, but it had little influence on the subsequent development of notation. This is because of its subsequent history and because it wasn't printed. It fell into the hands of one of his pupils, Etienne de la Roche, who plagiarised large parts of it under his own name as arithmetic newly arranged. Unfortunately, he left out the more original parts. Schuke's manuscript had a chequered career until its rediscovery in the 19th century. From these two pages, we can tell that it passed through a number of private libraries, eventually ending up in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. But the library catalogues gave no hint of Schuke's algebra. So when the Tripati was published in 1880, it created a sensation, for Schuke had been entirely forgotten. Pacioli's Summa is in a long tradition of vernacular Italian works in which problems of commerce played an important role. In fact, Schuke's work is also linked to the same tradition, we know Lyon was an important centre of the spice trade between the Middle East and Western Europe, and that it had a large Italian colony. This tradition of Italian manuscripts, stretching back to the 13th century, has been largely ignored until recently. They all owe much of their inspiration to one particular work, the Liber Abaci, written in 1202 by Leonardo of Pisa, often known as Fibonacci. Here it is, in a printed form published in 1857. It's mostly remembered today for a sequence of numbers now called the Fibonacci sequence. It arises out of a problem concerning the breeding of rabbits. Each number is the sum of the preceding two numbers. It's remarkable because of the number of ways in which it turns up in nature, but its mathematical properties weren't appreciated by Leonardo or his contemporaries. They became known only in the 19th century. What's of more interest to us is that the Liber Abaci revolutionized the low-level mathematics of the West by promoting the Hindu-Arabic numerals and the methods of calculation that went with them. Leonardo was born in Pisa around 1170, a member of the Bonacci family, hence Fibonacci. He tells us about his life in the preface to the Liber Abaci. He was brought up in North Africa, where his father was a local official in the Italian trading colony at Bougie. From a Muslim teacher, he learned calculation using the Hindu-Arabic numerals. He travelled extensively on business trips before returning to Pisa to write the Liber Abaci and other works. He appreciated the benefits for merchants in calculating with the Hindu-Arabic numerals, which were far easier to use than Roman numerals. One great advantage over the counting board, the abacus, was that there was a record of stages of calculations which could be checked. 
the manuscript begins by describing the basic arithmetical operations using the new numbers. Here's the result of the multiplication of 37 by 49. Leonardo then checks this using a method known as casting out nines. We first add the digits of each of the numbers to be multiplied. 9 and 4 is 13. We then cast out the 9, that is, we divide by 9, leaving remainder 4. 7 and 3 is 10, divide by 9, and the remainder is 1. Now for the product. 8 and 1 and 1 and 3 is 13. Divide by 9, and the remainder is 4. We now just check that the product of these two remainders is the same as the remainder from the overall product, which it is. Here, Leonardo writes that his calculation is proved by the number 4. One problem-solving method used by medieval mathematicians and promoted by Leonardo was the rule of double false position. Let's look at a typical example. A merchant travels between three cities in Italy. He goes from Lucca to Florence and then on to Pisa. In each city, he doubles the amount of money he entered with and then spends ten denarii. He ends up with no money. So how much did he start with? We begin with a guess. Suppose he starts off with twelve denarii. At Lucca, he doubles this to twenty-four and then spends 10, leaving 14. At Florence, he doubles this to 28, spends 10, leaving 18. At Pisa, he doubles this to 36, spends 10, leaving 26. So at the end of his travels, he is left with 26 denarii, which is 26 too much. So we make a second guess. Suppose instead he starts off with 11 denarii, it turns out he now finishes with 18. There was a standard diagram.